Okay, folks, um, into our third chapter now. Now, the assessment on this chapter will be worth 20%, but I haven't given any thought to what it'll actually be. Um, I do, I have in the past assessed the first two chapters using assignments, so I was kind of comfortable, but I've never um, done that with this chapter. Uh, with this section, we'll say that um, it, 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 there's going to be slightly less of Although I've always pushed the idea that understanding is key for doing your maths, and I believe it's true, um, you you would probably still see, oh, look at the questions that we did, and you'd like to see examples, and you kind of work according to the example, you know, you kind of get the method. Uh, I will tell you, as I said, I think I said it in an earlier lecture, it will come to pass next semester, if you choose the maths next semester, that that approach will just break down. You're going to have to really start understanding the maths, or else... Like if you think of the method as as a kind of directions for driving home, um, the directions are too complicated. And that's not how, like if you have a very complicated drive home, you don't sit in the car and think, oh, I do left, left, right, left. You don't think like that. You just drive. You go to the next step. Um, we probably have a similar story here because I haven't come up with the assignment. Um, I'm probably going to mostly be testing the understanding. Well, a combination of understanding and calculations. The calculations in this chapter are n not too difficult. And once you understand what's going on, the calculations aren't difficult. Uh, now, we'll have just a, a relatively short... Um, well, I don't know how long the lecture will go, but we're not going to look at much this week because the focus is still on Chapter 2. But what I will say is that I've learned probably since coming to CIT and um, talking with the engineers, that out in the field, uh, statistics, probability statistics, same thing, kind of, uh, is far more important than engineering than I, I actually knew. And hopefully we'll give some flavour of that uh, through this chapter. Okay. So we'll give some um, motivation. So uh, in the last chapter, so when we were doing the numerical solution of a beam equation, so when you didn't have a formula for the load or you had a formula but you couldn't anti-differentiate it, we, we made approximations and similar, we'll do something similar in chapter four, but we never measured how accurate our approximate solutions were. Uh, statistics is really going to be interested in this kind of a question. So what you're going to do is you're going to make some kind of an approximation by doing what's called a sample and it's going to be very important for you to say how accurate it is. Now the only problem is you're not going to be totally sure about how accurate it is but you're going to have a level of confidence. So you're going to say oh I'm 95 or 99 percent sure that the materials in this bridge are strong enough so that it won't fail or whatever. So suppose you have a business which constructs a machine component. Suppose the company ordering the component wishes to know what stress level the component can take. So when you, anything in the real world, nothing is perfect, uh, there's going to be variations. So some of the components um, might have parts that fail. So due to natural variations, some samples will have a larger tolerance than others. So how that happens, very, you know, all materials aren't created equally, hot day, cold day, um, machines running too fast, machines running too slow. There's lots of different things that can play a role and make something that's designed to make the same thing again and again and again. Um, be it a component used in engineering as well, but there is variation. So how can we approach the business and say that our components can take a stress level? Like how do you write, oh, this can take whatever, 100 kilonewtons per square millimeter, something like that. Um, in practice, you can't. So what you do instead is you say, what you do is you, you put an average amount on it. Now, how you actually do that might be a, um, there's probably different ways. So mathematically, you just put in the average but maybe what you would do is something like you would say that, say, the, the component takes a stress level of, just I'm just writing down a random number here, 125. So that's some kind of stress level and some kind of units that we say that our components can take. Now, you can't really guarantee that every single one um, does that. But what you can do is you can say maybe 1% um, of them aren't strong as strong as that or really what I'm saying there's 99% of them are stronger or maybe you go 99.9% are strong can take more than this or maybe 99.99 oh sorry yeah 99 well it'll be written as decimals 0.999 
So one of the things about standards and quality standards is making this number as big as possible. So you're into ISO and quality. Quality is about um, kind of guaranteeing that, say, maybe only one in a million of the devices fail. You'll never give 100% certainty. Well, you can, but you'll have to back it up with compensation or whatever. So you, if you want to find out how strong these things are, you can't go around testing every single one of the components. Perhaps it produces like a millions of components. You can't test every single one. So what you do is you do, you do a sample. You look at a hundred of them or a thousand of them. You take them away and have them tested. Um, in this module, we'll see that we can be quite confident that the average ability to withstand stress of all the components we produce is very well estimated by the sample average. Now, what that means is we're going to learn that in a certain sense, the, say you're trying to find this, so you'll find the stress level of all these, so you keep working them until they fail, and you record all those numbers, and you take the average of those, that'll be a very, very good estimate in a certain sense, in a, up to a, a level that we can talk about, of the average of all of them. Now that's different to this one. Um, so sampling theory is something we're going to look at in this uh, chapter. Um, probably not this, well definitely not this week. Okay, we're just going to do some theoretical background for probability and statistics this week. Okay, so the central concept of probability theory is that of a random variable. So examples of random variables, so it's something that it has some outcomes uh, but you can't really predict which. But what you can try and do is maybe associate a probability to outcomes happening. So the outcome of a coin flip or a dice roll. So obviously the coin flip. Um, now I want to be careful. So there's outcomes and there's events. Um, yeah, so the we're going to talk about the outcomes. So the outcomes when you flip a coin is head and tail. And the outcome when you roll a dice is one or two or three up to six. So there are the outcomes. Now the events then are um, things that you can form out of the outcomes. So an example of an event would be that the dice roll is bigger than three. And it's the events that you assign probabilities to. So what's the probability that you roll a dice you get larger than three? Um, another event might be What's the probability that you roll the dice and you get two? Something like this. And the outcome of a random selection of a card from a deck. So obviously all the outcomes are the 52 cards of the deck. Let's write down some um, uh, events. And the events are the things that you associate a probability. So well, how about the card is black or um, a jack? So you can associate a probability to this event. The number of plants which grow to maturity in a glasshouse. Now, presumably, this is going to be out of, say, a certain number of them, which I'm going to call, I think, N. This used to be a bigger thing before. Um, so this might be something like, um, maybe more an engineering context. I don't know if a pile drive can fail. I don't know what that would mean, but imagine it did. So imagine you did 100 pile drives, and then you might be interested in the probability that 90 or more succeed, something like that. So here, say for example, uh, you might be interested in the probability that the number of plants which grow to maturity, which we'll call M, let's say is bigger than 10, say out of 12, something like that. Um, now these ones are all what are called discrete. So there's only not only is there finitely, it's not quite that there's only finitely many outcomes, um, but you can break down the outcomes such that there's kind of no outcomes between other outcomes, whereas this thing is continuous, so the amount of time spent on hold, like you can talk about a minute and a minute and a second, but you could also have a minute and a half a second. You could also have a minute and a quarter of a second. And so you can't like list out all the uh, possible outcomes. So the events here will be different. So we're going to learn that, say, um, say the time spent is t, you can have an event that the time spent is exactly equal to one minute. Now this means that the um, it's one minute, zero seconds, zero microseconds, zero milliseconds, sorry, milliseconds first probably, zero microseconds, just exactly one minute. Now we're going to learn a little later on that the probability that the call takes ex exactly one minute is zero. 
but typically more the kind of thing you'd be looking at is what's the probability that the time spent on hold is larger than five minutes. That's the kind of event that we can assign a probability. And uh, the height of an Irish male chosen at random. So this is a similar story to this. So what's the probability, for example, that someone has a height between say 183 centimeters and 180 centimeters. The probability that you're exactly 183 centimeters is zero. Okay, so associated to a random variable, there is a probability distribution. A good way to introduce a random variable is, now this isn't going to be so big because I've thrown out some of the types of random variables from previous years. So there used to be what are called Poisson random variables and um, binomial random variables, but we're just gonna have normal random variables. So the one that we're gonna see is, I'm, I'm gonna, rec so I recommend that you write down, and I, I it may come past that, um, like, will I ask for, like, will I give marks for the notation and the assignment? Well, if I do, it'll be signaled well in advance. So, say, for example, it's the height. I want you to write down x is defined to be equal. So, just so you have some symbols to work with. Um, well, maybe I shouldn't insist on you doing that. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. So, x is defined, so this thing means defined equal to be uh, height. I'm just going to write Irish male. Uh, it has to be to be a random variable, it has to be a randomly chosen Irish male. And then the distribution. So this symbol means distributed as. Now what I'm going to write after this, you may or may not remember from school, you probably didn't write like this. So the normal distribution is a bell-shaped curve, and that's kind of roughly the distribution of uh, heights of populations. And let's say the average um, say is maybe something like 178 centimeters. And the standard deviation is kind of how spread out that that is. I've no idea what that would be. Let's just write five centimeters. Okay. So this one I'm kind of recommending. So the prob what is the probability distribution? We'll talk a bit more about this on the uh, next page. I want this idea of events to be foremost, or not foremost in your mind, but I want it in your mind. Okay. So the probability distribution P of a random variable is a function. So it takes as inputs, events, and spits out a number between zero and one. So, um... So for example, this event, probability that a dice rolls bigger than three is 50%. Probability that a dice rolls two is one in six. These these numbers I'm quoting are numbers between zero and one. The probability that a card is uh, black or a jack, I think is 28 over 52. Uh, and then, well, for this, you need other, I can't assign probabilities easily to that. Um, but this one, you're, you'll be making assumptions about the statistics that the average height is 178 and something called the standard deviation is 5 centimeters. You'll assign a number between 0 and 1 to this event. So, for example, if x is a coin toss, then all the possible outcomes are when you, you get a head, you get a tail, you get none, so you get nothing, you don't get a head or a tail, or you get either a head or a tail. So the probability that you get neither a head nor a tail is 0, probability that you get a head is a half, same as probability that you get a tail, and probability that you get either, that's a head or a tail, is one. So you definitely get a head or a tail. Now this, if you were doing more pure maths, would be written like this, empty set, and this would be written head and tail, and we'd actually put curly brackets around these as well, but I won't worry about that. So in a finite system, we usually define the probability of A occurring. Now this is only if each uh, if each outcome is equally likely. Just count up the number of ways that it can happen divided by the total number of outcomes. Now I'm assuming that you have a rough understanding of probably a feeling for understanding what's a rare event, what's a common event, etc. Um, if it is an issue for you, well, we'll see. Okay, so let's look at some remarks on this setup. In a finite system, so this is, so with an infinite number of possible outcomes, things are a little trickier. So for example, if you're talking about time, there's infinitely many possible times. Like even between one minute and two minutes, there's infinitely many. Like if you say, oh, no, there's only 60, there's a minute, minute one, second, minute two. Well, what about one and a half seconds? What about one and a quarter seconds? So there's infinitely many outcomes there and things get a bit tricky. But if it's a finite system where there's only finitely many possible outcomes, so here like there's four, um, outcomes that never happen are assigned a probability of zero. So zero means never happens, but um, only in a finite system. It's possible in an infinite system, we'll talk about this a bit later, 
that probability zero events can happen. And similarly, pro probability one events don't happen. But in a finite system, zero means never happens. One means always. So for example, let's take um, some examples. So when you roll the dice, what is the probability? Now let's write down an event that when you roll the dice, you get bigger than six. Now, uh, if I was with the computer science people now, a lot of them into kind of games and that, you know, and they'd be rolling dice and they've all different 20 sided dice and whatever, but we're obviously just gonna work with a six sided dice. What's the probability that you get bigger than six? Well, it's zero because the outcome is always between one and six. And similar story, why be a five card poker hand? What's the probability of um, two of same suit? Now this is equal to one. I'll just explain why. So the suits are what are hearts, spades, diamonds, clubs. I'll just write these out. So hearts and diamonds are your red suits. Uh, clubs and spades are your black suits. Now, could you get five different, is it possible to get uh, a five card poker hand with five different suits? No, it isn't. Two of them have to match. So you definitely have two of the same suit. So if it's definitely the case, the probability is one. Okay, um, so if A and B are mutually exclusive, now uh, we'll probably need to explain a few things that are mutually exclusive, and we'll see in a, yeah we'll see an example well, we'll see an example later on. So mutually exclusive events are things that cannot happen at the same time. So for example, um, the probability, no, not even talking about probability, but say. Um, can a component fail and not fail? No, it either fails or not fails. It can't do both. Could the stress of a device be bigger than 100 and less than 80? No, it couldn't. It can't be both of those at the same thing. And if things can't happen at the same time, they're called mutually exclusive. Um, now, often in maths, we draw a picture for this, and I normally don't do that in this class, but let's do it. So you can actually do, uh, so I don't know if you remember Venn diagrams, but you can do a lot of probability concepts using Venn diagrams. So this is one situation, and here's another one. Now what I'm gonna go with, because I know that it is um, something that uh, comes into one of my examples soon, is we'll talk about the lengths of a randomly selected rod. So here, suppose um, you've got two events. A is that, I'm just gonna write the things here. The length is less than 100 centimeters. And B is the event that the length is greater than 80 centimeters. Now they can happen at the same time. So anything strictly between 80 and 100 is in here. So this is the length is less than 100 and bigger than 80, there are things in here. Whereas if I roll with something like less is L is less than 100 and L is greater than 120, well, can you have the length of a, a specific, these are both centimeters, uh, a given rod, can it be both less than 100, so short, say, and longer than 120? No, it'll either be one or it'll either be that, that, or neither. So these are mutually, mutually exclusive. Okay, um, these are not mutually exclusive. So the mutual, uh, it's about two things. Okay, so if um, events are mutually exclusive, like this, the probability of A or B happening is equal to the sum of the probabilities. So what's the probability that uh, a rod, a randomly selected rod, is less than 100 or bigger than 120 would be the probability that it's less than 100 plus probability that it's uh, bigger than 120. This one is going to be a bit more complicated, uh, which we're eventually going to fix, I presume. <laughs> no, I'm going to have to put the proper, um, we'll put it on the top of the next page, okay. So we'll do the, the proper thing. So in general, So this is for things that are not necessarily, in fact, this is this form I'm going to write, it's always true. 
the probability of an event A or B happening is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. And then the, the issue is, if you think in terms of like this, so if you calculate the probability of A here, plus the probability of B, you're counting this probability twice. So you have to take one of them away. Minus the probability of A and B. And you see if A and B can't happen at the same time, certainly a finite system, it's assigned the probability of zero. And so that bit is gone. And so if they're mutually exclusive, you just get this. Bit. So this bit is equal to zero for mutually exclusive. So I think we're going to, I'm probably not gonna, well, probably not gonna push this bit too much, but you just know that if it's mutually exclusive, that bit's zero. So a random selection from a deck of cards. So what's the probability of a, um, say getting x equal to a jack or x being between seven and say nine then you can just because these can't happen at the same time you can't get a, a, a card being between seven and nine and jack at the same time so the probability here you'll just add them so the probability of a jack is i'm gonna go back to here how do we do these finite probabilities number of ways that the event can happen over the total number of outcomes so how many ways can you get a jack well there's four suits so there's four ways you can get a jack over total number of outcomes when you draw a card is 52 plus how many ways can you get uh between seven or nine equal to seven or nine so that's seven eight or nine and if you think about each suit so there's three of hearts there seven of hearts eight of hearts nine of hearts three more of clubs three more of spades three of diamonds that'll be 12 over 52 which is 16 over 52, which can be simplified to, I think, 4 over 13. Okay. So let's do a little more here. So let A be some outcome. Now, either A occurs or not A occurs. Um, so this is saying that something happens or doesn't happen. And also they're mutually exclusive. So, for example, take a component. It either fails or it doesn't fail. And those things cannot happen at the same time. Something can fail and not fail. So what we can do is we can use um, this formula here for A or not A, because they can't happen at the same time as probability of A plus probability of not A. And we know that something happens or doesn't happen. So the probability of that is equal to one. So what we get is something like this. So let's write um, probability a, something happening, or not A, um, it's equal to, because these can't happen at the same time, the or means plus, probability of A plus probability of not A. And we said that A or not A always happens, so something that always happens, certainly in this finite system, has a probability of 1. And what we can do now is we can take away the probability of A from both sides and we get that. And this should be a natural thing. The probability of something not happening is 1 minus probability, probability of it happening. So, for example, if the probability of rain is 20% on a day, the probability of not rain is 80%. That's all that is. Okay. And this can make uh, some things a little bit easier for us. So, for example... Look at this question, let x be three coin flips. Now we can write out all the possibilities, but we won't do that. So what's the probability of getting at least a tail? So it, you can make this kind of difficult and you can look at all the possibilities. So you can have tail, head, head, um, head, tail, head, uh, head, head, tail. You can go through, so that's one tail. And at least tail, at least one tail means one or more tails. Think about it, if you're gonna have at least four drinks, you're gonna have four or more. So then you also have tail, tail, head, tail, head, tail, and finally head, tail, tail, and then tail, tail, tail. And so, and if you just write in the other possibility, which is three heads, you can see that the answer is going to be seven eighths. And okay, that's not the end of the world, 
but what if there was not three coins but 50 coins then what would you do well then what you do is you'd say getting at least one tail is not head 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 so you want to say that the probability of at least one tail is equal to the probability of not head 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 and then the probability of not something is one minus the probability of that something and then you probably have to go back into this and list all the outcomes after all <laughs> having said all that well there's a different way to calculate the probability of head 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 which we'll see probably in the next lecture well anyway there's eight out outcomes one two three four five six seven eight and head 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 is only one of them so it's one minus one over eight seven eights which is an easier way of calculating it rather than going through all that so sometimes and often it will be the case in this uh, it'll be easier to find the probability of something not happening and taking that away from one okay i think that's enough for this uh, first lecture here